There may be a hundred million black holes scattered across the Milky Way. Anything that strays too close to these dark remnants of burned out stars will be pulled in by an intense gravitational field. But what actually happens to the stuff that falls into a black hole? Is it simply wiped out of existence? Or do black holes remember? These are the battle lines of the black hole war. A battle with repercussions that the men who started it could never have imagined. It's a war between two giant minds. On one side, the famous physicist Stephen Hawking. On the other, Leonard Susskind, one of the creators of string theory, a notoriously difficult branch of physics. Stephen Hawking argues black holes destroy what they swallow without a trace. Leonard Susskind passionately disagrees. But for 10 years, he struggled to find anything wrong with Hawking's concept of how black holes radiate away the matter they swallow. It was thought to be inconceivable that somehow the things which fell into the black hole could have anything to do with the Hawking radiation, which was coming out from very, very far from where the particles fell in. Then he began looking at the problem in a new way. Call it the dead and alive paradox. It's a cosmic thought experiment starring an astronaut named Alice, her friend Bob, and a black hole. Bob is orbiting the black hole in a spaceship, and Alice decides to jump into the black hole. What does Bob see, and what does Alice see? Well, Bob sees Alice falling toward the black hole, getting closer and closer to the horizon, but slowing down. Because the gravity of the black hole severely distorts space and time near the event horizon, Einstein's theory of relativity predicts that Bob will see Alice moving slower and slower until she eventually stops. So, from Bob's point of view, Alice simply becomes completely immobile with a big smile on her face, and that's the end of the story. It takes forever for Alice to fall through the black hole. On the other hand, Alice has a completely different description of what happens. She just falls completely cleanly through the horizon, feeling no pain, no bump. It's only when she approaches the interior when she starts to feel uncomfortable. And at that point, she starts to get more and more distorted, and I don't want to go into in detail what happens to her. It's not pretty. These two descriptions of the same events appear to be at odds. In one, Alice is stuck at the event horizon. In the other, she sails right through. In one version, she dies. In the other, she's frozen in time, but alive. But then, Leonard Susskind suddenly realized how to resolve this paradox and win the black hole war. Well, I began to think that some of the ideas that we had developed for string theory could help resolve this problem, this paradox. One way of thinking about string theory is that elementary particles are simply more than meets the eye. You see this propeller here? This propeller, when it's spinning very, very rapidly, all you see is the central hub. It looks like no more than a simple particle, but if you had a really high-speed camera that could catch it as it was spinning, you would discover that there's more to it than you realize. There's the blades and the blades would make it look bigger. In string theory, an elementary particle has vibrations on top of vibrations. It's as though this propeller had on the ends of its blades more propellers. And those propellers had propellers on the ends of their blades, out to infinity. Each propeller going faster than the previous one. As you would catch it with a higher and higher speed camera, you would see more and more structure come into focus. And the particle would seem to grow. It would grow endlessly until it filled up the whole universe. Then it realized that a black hole is like an ultra-high-speed camera. It appears to slow objects down as they approach the event horizon. Time for another thought experiment. The black hole, Bob and Alice, are back. But this time, Alice has an airplane. 
powered by a string theory propeller. For Alice, not much changes. She sits in the cockpit and flies right over the event horizon, all the time seeing just the central hub of her propeller. And she meets the same horrible fate at the heart of the black hole, this time accompanied by some plane debris. Bob's view is very different. So first he sees the first propeller come into existence. Then later, when it slowed down even further, he begins to see the outer propellers come into existence, sort of one by one, and the effect is for the whole propeller to get bigger and bigger and bigger and grow and eventually be big enough to cover the whole horizon. These two views no longer seem so irreconcilable. Alice is either squished at the center of the black hole or smeared all over the event horizon. Leonard has a name for this new way of seeing things, the holographic principle. I began to think, hey, wait a minute, this sounds awfully much like a hologram. There's Alice at the center, and if I look at the, let me not call it the horizon, let me just call it the surface, the film, all you see is a completely scrambled mess, and somehow they're representing exactly the same thing. Leonard's idea that the event horizon of a black hole is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object at its center solves the problem of information loss. Every object that falls into a black hole leaves its mark both at the central mass and on the shimmering hologram at the event horizon. When the black hole emits Hawking radiation from the horizon, that radiation is connected to the stuff that fell in. Information is not lost. In 2004, at a scientific conference in Dublin, Hawking conceded defeat. Black holes do not destroy information. Leonard Susskind had won the black hole war. But he'd done much more than that, because the theory does not merely apply to black holes. It forces us to picture all of reality in a new way. It's as if there were two versions of the description of you and me and what's in this room. One of them being the normal perceived uh, three-dimensional reality, and the other being a kind of holographic image on the walls of the room, completely scrambled, but still with the same exact information in it. That idea has now, it's not an idea anymore, it's a really basic principle of physics that information is stored on a kind of holographic film at the edges of the universe. In a sense, three-dimensional space is just one version of reality. The other version exists on a flat holographic film billions of light years away at the edge of the cosmos. Why these two realities seem to coexist is now the biggest puzzle physics needs to solve. One of the big challenges that comes out of all of this is understanding space itself. Why is space three-dimensional when all of the information that's stored in that space is stored as a two-dimensional hologram? A black hole raises these challenges and really sharpens these challenges because it's practically a place where ordinary space doesn't exist anymore. So if I'm asked questions about how space emerges, I will simply have to say, well, we're thinking about it. We don't understand it. Black holes have been a source of fascination for almost a century. We've thought of them as time machines, shortcuts to parallel universes, as monsters that will one day devour the Earth. Well, any of these ideas may turn out to be true one day, but right here, right now, black holes have a profound effect on you and me. Their shimmering holographic surfaces seem to be telling us that everything we think is here is mirrored out there at the very end.